Hi, welcome, Julia. D Julia, you there? Hey. Hi. Hi. I'm going to uh, introduce you now. You, uh, uh, Julia Langren Rodriguez, and uh, you've written this book that you would like to talk about, and also make the connection to what's happening in Mexico right now. And uh, I'll let you start off. See, get Thank coordinated you. Thank here. You. And uh, tell us about the book that's in process, or the mu as much mm -hmm. as you've done. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you said that you're still uh, editing it, but I haven't talked to you much about that. Sorry about this yeah. technical stuff here going on. There, microphone. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So, so the, the the series of the land grab books that I started have still just been unfolding, and I came from Santa Cruz to work on my Billy the Kid book um, yeah. three years mm -hmm. ago. And that book just um, ended, but I, I I found another character I really wanted to to dedicate a whole book to, and that's Carla Varela of Mexico. She was the last Empress of Mexico. Um, she was she was in a bad timing in a sense, but she's the main character in my book called The Fall of the House of Marion Blackberry and the Division of the Star, and. Um, her, the book was basically a homage to her, but it got carried away with the men that were involved in her life. And the most interesting thing about Carla Varela is that she she was raised here, born and raised here, so she's quite a, a character to New Mexico. Her collections are here in Mesilla, where I am, and as you know, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War was signed here, too. Right. Um, she was basically, she's the daughter of who I call Marion Blackberry, and what I'm translating is the Cabeza de Vaca house. I'm talking about the, ho the fall of the house of Cabeza de Vaca. And there was a conspiracy around her birth. She was born in 1874, and there was a conspiracy well orchestrated that was going to help the land grabs unfold in a more... I guess, controlled fashion, because the more I look at the land grab history, and I have the land grab titles in front of me, and I want to talk to you about the grantee and the claimants and these 15 families that basically have all of these lands that went up in smoke when uh, Mexico ceded uh, the, more than half of its territory to the United, to the United States. Um, so there's these conspiracies around the use of the women that are on the land grants because there's a matrilineal succession of land titles. Um, and so these women, for example, um, Carlota's grandmother, she's one of the first ones to go missing in 1848. And that's right when the Mexican-American War ends. Well, you think it ends, but it really takes a covert turn. Yes. Well, and her... her her father also is a victim of this, and that same year, he's kidnapped. He's just a young boy. But her, uh, let me tell you who she is so you can get an idea of, uh, like yeah, please. On, she, uh, on the idea of who these people are. So she was the daughter of Marie-Sophie of the Prit of the, Pre of the Pendragons, a granddaughter of the Hessen Kessel of the Landgravites, you know, and we have the Hearst Castle here. Um, and Carlota, one of Carlota's fake identity is that of Julia Morgan. It's a forgery that it was built in 1905. Um, that's just not true. The, the Hessen Kessel is a much older house of Landgravites that are here when this part of New Spain is a French, a French vassal under Vespania in 1789. And so these are the early years of... Um, this woman that I'm, I'm working on, which is Carlota's grandmother, and I've, all my books basically have dealt with her. She's famous to us as Julia Armstrong, but she's the real mother of George Hurst and of J.P. Morgan Chase. And these little boys are, are um, her children that actually go missing when she disappears. And oh. so I've kind of given a homage to, to looking at her history and what happened to her. She was a half-sister to Maximilian of Mexico. Maximilian was the last emperor of Mexico. He was born in 1808. He likes to extend himself into the late 1700s, but he's really from 1808, and she's from 1803. 
So that gives us George Hurst and J.P. Morgan are born in the 1830s. And there's one little boy that, that goes kidnapped in that same year. But Carlota's father, who I call Marion Barry, because Barry in Latin is, is Baca. Ah. It's not cow. So when we translate the Cabeza de Vaca expeditions up the Camino Real uh, in New Spain, these caravans like of Dianza and Oñate, um, the Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros expeditions, um, these are people that are coming after the conquest of Granada into New Spain, so early 1500s. And these guys aren't discoverers. They're actually traitors in the lives of um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire who has tabs on Mexico. And so when Oñate comes, I'm right now on the Oñate Trail, and there are large land grants that belong to her family. Well, it's partially their kidnapped children and the grandmother who goes missing. Mm-hmm. So Car- Carlota's life, I decided to dedicate a book to her. It's called The Fall of the House of Mary and Blackberry. And then The Division of the Star, because I'm trying to talk about the geopolitical and the strategic locations of the Camino Real in terms of it's the heart of Mexico. The, even the word Mexico comes from um, belly button connected to the moon. And there's the, these old rivers that actually come all the way up, which are the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo. And before the Gadsden Purchase, there was another river that they argue moved, but they acquired Gadsden in 1863. It was the last piece of Mexico to be ceded to the United States, but it was an actual breach of a river. The river didn't actually move. The river was breached and many things were broken down. So I'm here studying in Doña Ana. It's the territory that um, extends all the way to Sonora. It was called the San Antonio land grant. And that San, San Antonio de Bejar or Santa Antonieta de Bejar, it's actually a reference to um, Princess Antonieta of France. But, you know, they've genderized male and they've kind of disconnected any French or Portuguese or any other Austrian or, you know, Mexican history is very distorted at this point, And so is the American history. Mm-hmm. And it's because of this distortion that people are uh, are not up on what is really going on and what's come before so that we have a. Uh, What's California today, and and what's um, you know? Yeah, we don't families. think about California in terms of the loss to the land grant. So in the book, what I'm trying to deal with with Carlota is the characters in her life to really make them, to really bring them to life. Um, her children were born in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, and that's time enough to know your great grandparents. So she's not that far away in history. And she was written down, you know, by somebody who really forged history. That's the Emperor Maximiliano Luna, Zavala y Sainz. So he's the last name that's found on the Doniana and Sandoval, New Mexico territories in 1803 and 1808. And he goes down in history as one of the main traders of Mexico. He's a contemporary of uh, the President Santa Ana, the nine-term President Santa Ana, and these two men, along with like John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, et cetera, they wreak havoc on what Mexico after the American Civil War. So we go straight into the Lincoln County Wars, and Carla uh, is born four years prior. Mm-hmm. So my books that started in Santa Cruz on the Magnolia Rose, you know, which is the old Capitola Hotel, whenever the capital was still in Capitola of the Red Collars when New Spain and the ports and the navies were very strong at that time. Um, Then the movement um, after the loss of Texas and California in 1832, the movement of the capital comes to the Hacienda Nacional, which was here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And it's a building that's been deconstructed and the history is largely lost. It was inside a park they call Apodaca and Maximilian was on those titles, and before that there um, to the family Ferrer, Ferrer Duran de Armijo. And you can trace them all the way back to the, oh well, it's just very important families that are part of the Duke of the Infantas during Isabel of Castillo, the time of Portugal. So there's a whole lost Portuguese history, there's a whole lost, um, you know, the, the Muslim history of Spain is lost, and Carla's kind of born to unite these big houses. 
So her father's side, uh, grandmother, comes from a Celtic house of Bendragon, and that's where Hearst, Hearst has his landmine titles. And then her mother is a Celtic, her mother is a, is a Heinz heiress, but who also doesn't survive because Maximilian, as an emperor of Mexico, they already have in their, in a long time period, been taking women captive. So they've had all these lines of the women kind of, as, yeah, as, as captives in their lives. And Carla was written in as his wife. So in official history, Carla, Carlota of Belgium, they call her Carlota Maeses. Um, she's written in as the wife of Maximilian, Maximiliano Luna, the last emperor of Mexico, this traitor. But he was 70 years her senior. So uh. those are forgeries of history. <laughs> and she yeah. lived as a, as a captive of the famous Charles Maxwell, who, was, who acquired two million or more um, acres of the San Antonio land grant. And also he's the famous Henry Cowell, who donated University of California Santa Cruz land. Yeah. So she was a captive of him. He was born her same year. Um, but they just used her to have, you know, all her children were taken from her, basically. And her life was just controlled by men. And the main conspiracy began in 1874 in the Magnolia Rose Mansion in Capitola. And there's an actual hotel roster, a sign-in list where these men sign in, it's a little hard to disambiguate, but I did actually publish parts of the list, <laughs> kind of get in, get in trouble for it, because they're all the same families that are on the land grants today. It's Forbes and Oppenheimer, and um, all of these families that are consolidated, they look like 15 families, but they're actually just slight forgeries on the same families, and they go through the hearse, um, to the land, to the Bureau of Land Management, and then they go into this, into their, the families that are claiming them. And so those are the, the land grants of Juliet Armijo, and that was Carlota's grandmother who, who was the first one to kind of disappear. But what's interesting is that I've been looking closely at the man who, um, well, who's on the forgeries because she should have been the one on the forgeries. So they, they replace her with somebody who's actually not real. And that name is over and over as the one granting the land grants. And he turns out to be, he turns out to be just a fake stand-in for somebody who's involved in the Mexican Revolution and also is an enemy of Pancho Villa. Oh. So then the Villistas got dragged into the picture and the book had to totally be rewritten. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now, is trying to contextualize her life as a contemporary of Pancho Villa and the revolutionaries such as Zapata and Gil wow. and Obregón. Oh. Okay, when, what year was Pancho Villa born? So Pancho Villa was born in 1883, and they put him at 1878, which is to mix up his date with his half-brother. And this is the other part of history um, that's, history is very distorted. So just like American history after the 1850s, it's quite, you know, dis it's, it's very wrong. It doesn't give us anything that's actually correct. It's the same thing with uh, Mexican history. There's a lot of distortions in history, and the one that's so clear to me right now, the more I study, is that Pancho Villa actually attacked here, where I am on the border in El Paso, Texas, and Mesilla. It wasn't in Columbus where he's displaced to. Part of the forgeries are to displace them into these, you know, to, to lessen the significance of the land. Uh, the old border, his mother had ranches here, his grandfather did too, but they displaced him into Oaxaca. So that kind of connects in what's going on with the teacher strikes down there, because um, part of what was going on at the time was the change in agrarian reform, and you know, Mexico didn't want an imperial family anymore. So there were general upheavals, but like in every revolution, they're using the, the people's movement, the energy, to kind of steal the revolution. And that's kind of what's happened. If you know, like the PRI in Mexico has been in power ever since the assassination of Mex of um, Pancho Villa. But what they do is they we have Vicente Fox that was in there a short time period. But you know, Fox is uh, the name goes to Fouché or Boucher. He's actually a descendant of Bush and aligned to Pat Garrett. You know, so there's never been a loss of power in the since that time. So more than almost a hundred years of the same political party in Mexico. And in these last midterm elections that they're involved in right now, 
um, there's already been like 12 killings or 12, 12 assassinations. Let me see how 20 some people were. Let me, I wrote it down. Let me see where it is. 21 people so far linked to the elections have been killed. Um, and they're just midterm elections, you know, so it's not, the president's not up for a re-election. It's the Chamber of Deputies, the lower Congress. There's 500 seats up for election. And um, there's 17 governors up for election. And, and it's the first election since Mexico has implemented their reforms. Those reforms are that the they want teacher evaluation, so the teachers are up in arms. Well, they say, but you see there's a lot of propaganda. Um, the same thing is because the disappearance of the students in the state of Guerrero, Iwala, where um, the, also the, the leader of the, the mayor candidate there was from a party right now that's also running that's the, I think it's the PRD party. So it's really distorted, but the links of of that to the Vista revolution is that those things were the same. There's there were teacher revolutions, there was agrarian revolution, and they were the the people that were joining the troops were being promised also agrarian reform. And there's a lot of animosity towards the landholders. They ha they were large landholders. This is the landholding of Hearst and J P Morgan. Well. J.P. Morgan is born in 1832. He's not that man that they show you that looks like a Christmas man with the blonde beard and fat. That's a forgery over who he was. Huh. Um, he was actually, uh, his last name comes from Morgan Castro Uraca, and they were on their Portuguese that were on the Sonoran land grants. His mother was on the land grants. And when he went missing, um, his uncle kidnapped him, and that's Maximilian of Mexico, <laughs> the emperor. So he already had like an agenda on how he did things. He actually helped disappear his own sister, which is Juliet Armijo. Those are the Duran de Armijo. Duran means hardened, and that's a reference to like the city of gold in the domes of the old mosques. So like when you eat your Doritos, Dorito, that means hardened, but Duran is the, is the word for hardened. It just means like the hardened rock. Mm-hmm. And de armijo just means her children, right. the children of the hardened rocks. Oh. And these are references to the infantas, and they're an old. They're, from there come all, all kings and queens. If you actually trace them, you can find the Angevin links to them, too. And, and then they move right into the English kings and queens and the Tudors and the Langravites. And then we're in the 16th century. So those are all histories that are kind of lost because the Camino Real is 4,000 years old. So we have a whole history that's lost. Um, so, but they were large landholders. So with Pancho Villa, the history is <laughs> it's just so tied up in hers. And with what's going on right now is we have in Mexico um, the very similar things happening. So Villa was in line for the presidency of Mexico. He was the governor of Chihuahua in 1913. He was the governor of Chihuahua in 1914, and his grandfather was the president of Mexico, an emperor of Mexico. They don't tell the, the um, true relationships because people that are in line for those types of roles don't raise their own children. Very often their children get other names or they're raised by aunts or cousins. They're moved around just to protect them. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing with Villa, like even his name, Pancho Villa, or they say Francisco Villa. That's not even his name. Francisco comes from his grandfather, and Villa comes from Vela or Varela, which is um, also Wella or Wells, like Indian Wells. But Villa, Villa's real name is, through his mother, he's Diaz, Varela Diaz, and through his father, they're, they're related to the Santísima Trinidad. So the Santísima Trinidad goes all the way back to Santa Ana. He was a triplet, and he was also a nine-time president of Mexico. He had two twin sisters. One of those twin <coughs> sisters um, also had triplets. She's the mom of Pancho Villa. So Pancho Villa was a uh, mother, was a triplet, and his uncle is Santa Ana. So there are all these inside very tight, tight breaks in the revolution and within the families. And that's the hard thing to understand is the actual transition of power. They don't really move that far. Power's not moving that far. 
And the more you look at the people that hold it, and if you go even back further, you can see that they've even held it longer. So if you look, for example, the Cardinal Pedro Gonzalez de Mendoza, he was in the cadet line, and he went clergy. He wasn't military, but this is the line that I'm telling you of the Santissima Trinidad. This means the sacred trinity. So there's these triplet births. And even Pancho Villa had triplets that got kidnapped in 1918. So it's a complicated story. It can go on and on because the people that kidnapped his children are, are landholders to this day. And it was the grandmothers that were listening. And it's women behind these revolutionaries. And that's the strangest thing. The more I look at it, the more I see the women are involved in it, the mothers and the grandmothers. They're the ones pushing these youth. I mean, Pancho Villa was bipolar probably by the time he was 20 and was stressed out big time. The reality of him is he, you know, he didn't do anything without his mom or brother behind him. Jeez. Um, well, <clears throat> it's it's good. Uh, so anybody that's re researching this would have to do a lot of digging. They wouldn't uncover this um, by opening any history book right now. No, no history book right now. There'll be all distortions and slight separations. It's not, there's partial truths and partial edits. And because all information is now electronic, it's so easy to, to, val to validate stuff that's not reliable as a source of information. So you have to be able to, I spend a lot of time looking at data and I have research assistants that, that speak multiple languages and that have the skills too in research that we spend a lot of time looking at the data we can find and it's not easy to find the black history data, you know. The, the black history is gone. The black history even of the Greeks is gone and this is the, the Spanish history, um, the indigenous history of, of the Infantas, the Dukes of the Infantas, you know, Diego Huerta de Mendoza. These are the Portuguese lady, ladies in waiting that are um, the time of Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar Mendoza, and these are the time of Philip II of Spain, and they're holding all this land we're on. So these are histories that are lost, um, wars that are lost, but families that are still holding power and also holding the key to information. And that's kind of how it, how it was. It's a key to information and inside information. So they placed Pancho Villa's death in 19... 23, and the person in presidency in Mexico in 1923 was Alvaro Obregón. And Obregón turns up to be one of the most interesting characters so far. I just, I'm amazed at, at his life. He's so many people. He was so many things to so many people. And that's a strange concept to consider. So the same thing with Carla. She was so many things to so many people. Now, what does that mean? It means that they did actually have various identities and they did feel in as different people in different roles because of the power that they had and played. But they had uh, they had uh, uh, people that prompted them to do these things or that you said mm -hmm. they were stressed out so they had to have some kind of... She was some, completely pushed. Her, her, yeah. her birth, um, her mother was killed at, right after her birth and they thought that um, her mother was going to be able to escape the mission in Carmel. Her mother was actually um, captive in a mission there in Carmel, Monterey, California, in Mexico. She was um, born in 1844, and she only survived until Carla's birth in 1874. So she died young. And there was already this ritual, and I, you know, it's an awful one, but they, they're waiting for the child of the heir. Oh. And they're like, they killed the mother. And I see that happening over and over. But um, Carla, Carla came to New Mexico during the Lincoln County Wars in 1877. And um, she was only four years old. But her birth was already planned. And it was, a, it was a strange concept, too. The more I looked at it, it was very strange. But it was to have a legitimate black child heir to rule the country. 
because, you know, Mexico had just yielded the largest part of its territory, and they were going to cover up the indigenous Spanish, Moorish, and Celtic, and Austrian, and every other thing that's on the Rio Grande. It's a lot of Jews, Germans, it's Mennonites. You know, the Rio Grande and the southern Rio Grande, and these roads are so ancient. They lead right from where I am to where you are. Ah. They're, they're so special, these routes, um, and where they are on the map geopolitically. So we're the belly button to Mexico as the center of the water systems. You know, more than 50% of all Mexico water is up here. And, well, the, wa- the rivers are dry now. They're dry as a bone. And, and the main breach of the river was a, was a horrible event. Um, but, you know, the road goes from here all the way up there. And those were the main ports that were lost in 1832. Those are the ports of the Marineros. So that's the old Bahia de los Marineros that's there that they barely fixed up. And then the other one is um, the port San Antonio de Bejar, which is right here. Because when Oñate came, they could travel by water. And he came with the granddaughter of Montezuma. You know, there was water systems. Now the water is dry as a bone. They're not coming by water anymore. But they actually breached the river to gain the Gadsden Purchase. Mm-hmm. And they they opened a, they opened and drowned a city, and that's Doñana. And that's another lost history because the Doñana history, she's from, they say from 1642 is when they did the plans for the city. And you can actually, you know, read the history of the person who wrote the plans for the city of Doñana and for the mosque of the Santa Maria that they broke. It was broken sometime in 1880. But um, those histories are lost and actual cities were drowned. And mm-hmm. those are histories that are not told in Doñana and they're, they're, I'm studying them. So I'm on the sites looking at the old maps, looking at the routes of the river. You can look at these through Google Earth to Google Earth Maps. And there's also, we use um, census data we use the 1870 new mexico new mexico census and we also have the artifacts from the museums so we try to use primary resource based data but mm, it's probably a small audience because it's very complicated information yeah so you have research assistants and uh, so the, the the ones that do all this laborious examination you know, aren't the average person I mean it really takes some yeah, dedicated. Mm-hmm. yeah the people that are dedicated actually turn out to be yeah quite invested in the discovery of the information so one of the persons that works for me mother was mm-hmm. um, raised in the same household where the children were kidnapped from Pancho Villa and those are the Baca family and they're large landowners and that's who I'm talking about the fall of the house of Marion Blackberry, the black baca, kind of like the black sheep. That's what I'm playing with, the idea of the black sheep. Oh, right. And he, he conspired, and that's Carlota's father. And if he didn't conspire, probably a lot of people wouldn't have lived, because he did save a lot of lives, but they they compromised they compromised the main women's lives. So um, hmm. the baca family, that's an interesting family to follow, because um, who... Cora Gurule and Kermit Roosevelt. So Kermit Roosevelt had a sister too, who was a Baca, and then she has a son who's a Baca. And these they're just recycling money over and over into the old house of Roosevelt, the old Roosevelts. Here they're called um, Ross, Reese, Cross, Gross. It's all the same family. So it was the time of Roosevelt, kind of, and Roosevelt really aided the loss of Mexico. His um and and the same thing with him, you know, he was raised by someone else, and his mom was kidnapped when she was twenty one and that's what's happening in Mexico. So when you think about the the location of the kidnapping, it happened the forty three students that are missing in Mexico from the state of Iwa, um Guerrero and Iwala right that that they call the plan of Iwala. that's where actually the emperor of Mexico, Agustin Iturbide, um and the famous, like, Jose Maria Morelos, they they wrote the plan to separate Mexico from Spain. That's ah. where it was drafted. So that, the explanation for those missing students was that the, some of them they thought was found. But when I interviewed Al Ro, um, Rojas recently, who has studied a lot about Mexico, and uh, 
uh, his his background is is his family's from Mexico. Um, that the, they aren't the actual students. The, the ones that say that they, they'd found their remains turn out that's not even. And is that what is that what you found out to be? That that this is yeah. They're not students. the they're yeah. The parents came through here, so I got to meet them in their caravan, and mm. they don't. They believe there's no well. There's no evidence so far, so they haven't been able to locate them. Um. And if you look historically at indigenous legends, it's really crazy and strange because there's a lot of patterns in the old indigenous stories of colonization and kidnapping of children like that, taking of large numbers of children from schools that happened a lot in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh -huh. And if you think about like what just came out in Canada with all the indigenous children being forced to residency homes and being removed, they did that a lot, and what they were doing was they were, you know, making them conform to whatever, whatever. And In I the still royal see families, that yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's no, there's no evidence that they, that the children have been killed. But what that sparked was um, so much disturbances because these right now in Mexico, these midterm elections are the first election since the disappearances. Oh yeah. So the people are really coming.